From the macroscopic to the microscopic, from giant galaxies to tiny atoms, three things are conserved in mechanics. Energy, momentum, and angular momentum. This is the third of our big three conservation laws, so hang on, we're going to go fast. As we said in class, conservation of angular momentum is the spinning version of the law of inertia. That is, an object that starts spinning will keep spinning at the same speed, in the same direction, and around the same axis of rotation until an outside force interferes. Just like an object moving will tend to keep moving in the same speed and in the same direction unless an outside force interferes. In this case, it's not going to be an outside force per se, it's an outside torque, but we'll get into that another time. The point is we've got a new variable. Speed stays the same, direction stays the same, and the axis of rotation stays the same. In this case, for this teetotum, or dreidel, the axis of rotation is vertical. You can see it in the picture right through the stem of the spinning top. Without an outside force, such as friction interfering, this spinning top will keep spinning at the same speed, in the same direction, which in this case is clockwise, and around the same vertical axis of rotation, unless an outside force interferes. Not only check the clockwise or counterclockwise, but check the axis of rotation. If it's vertical, it's going to stay vertical. That is, it can't fall down. The axis of rotation has to stay the same, oriented in the same direction, unless an outside force is going to produce a torque to interfere. Now, when we said an object in motion tends to stay in motion, we meant that it tends to keep the same momentum. Momentum is conserved. If you start with a certain momentum in your system, you're going to end with a certain momentum in your system, unless an outside force interferes. Our linear momentum, which we used P, don't blame you, I didn't write it, was mass times velocity, at least for things we can see how heavy you are, that is how hard you are to move, times how fast you're moving. Angular momentum will build in the same fashion. Angular momentum, well A is area, N is the normal, G is taken, U is magnetic permeability, L, here we go, we haven't used L yet, capital L, angular momentum, look at least it's somewhere in the letter, not like P, is how hard you are to spin that is to say your rotational inertia, or moment of inertia, times how fast you're spinning. See the analogy? It works if you look at it character by character. It really comes from the formal definition of angular momentum, which is the cross product of your radial distance, in this case the radius of the top, times p, the momentum with which that part of the top is spinning. You can see the cross product here. That means right-hand rule is coming. And we're going to use our right-hand rule for the vector direction of the angular momentum, which is the same vector direction as the angular velocity. As we said in class, we're going to use the right-hand rule. Check if you're a righty, put down your pen, run your fingers, and curl them in the direction of rotation of the top. Wait, no, that's counterclockwise. This top is going clockwise. There, clockwise. Axis of rotation is vertical, but more importantly, it's down. This is the negative y direction. This top has angular momentum in the downward direction, aka it is spinning clockwise around a vertical axis. This matches our sign convention for the right-hand rule that counterclockwise is positive and clockwise is negative. If you have an object on a picture that's a fixed radial distance from the center, use your thumb to point along that fixed radial distance. Use your second finger to point in the direction the object is currently traveling, that is the velocity. And your third finger, perpendicular to those two, will be in the direction of the angular momentum as per the right hand rule. In class, we did several examples of conservation of angular momentum. We had fun on the spinny stool where we saw the ice skater effect. What happens to the speed at which you spin when you pull your limbs in. Think about it. You are making yourself easier to spin by lowering your rotational inertia. You're taking more mass and bringing it in closer to the axis of rotation, and so you spin faster. When the skater wants to land, 
What does she do with her limbs to make herself spin more slowly in a controlled fashion? Look, she spreads her arms and legs way out. Make sure you have the notes from class about direction. There's only one ice skater here spinning in one direction. But we, when we found that when we sat on the spinning stool holding a bicycle wheel and we tilted the bicycle wheel from one direction to another, we suddenly started to spin in a direction where no spin had existed before. That's conservation of angular momentum. Spin the wheel one way, you will spin the other way for a grand total, clockwise plus counterclockwise, of an angular momentum of zero. Why? Because you were at rest in the beginning of the problem and no outside force interfered. The only force inside the problem, the one that provided the torque that started you turning, was the fact that turning the bicycle wheel on your on a spinning stool, and the bicycle wheel is also spinning, is surprisingly difficult to do. You can feel the force in your arms. The second example we did in class was the gyroscope. Here we have some footage of extreme unicycling. Don't ask. How do they stay up and not fall off those cliffs? Well, how does your bicycle stay up? How does your dreidel stay up? How does a toy gyroscope say spinning on its pointy end or even balanced on a wire or on the tip of your finger? Conservation of angular momentum <clears throat> plays a big role in all of these. Once you start spinning, you will keep spinning around the same axis. And unless an outside force interferes, that axis will stay in that same orientation, not just clockwise, but counterclockwise, but a horizontal axis for this unicycle or vertical axis for the spinning top or gyroscope. This works provided that an outside force such as friction doesn't interfere. It works beautifully in space where there's no way to tell which way is down or up. There's no way to figure out whether you're balanced or aligned or tilted. In space, take a gyroscope with you and make sure it's spinning. It will keep spinning around the same axis of rotation. If that way was up on Earth, it will still be up in space. You can use the gyroscope to balance equipment or balance the spaceship itself or to orient you where you are. And in the extreme case... Are you going to be able to hold this at all? I'm sorry. Can you lift it out? Make it horizontal. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Come on. Just try to... Okay. I want you to hold it out horizontally. See if you can. Oh, oh, oh. Well, as discovered by Kobe Drexler, Jason Tates, and Dylan Janisak in their physics expo, the Physics of Lifting Heavy Objects, we've got a 40-pound flywheel on the end of that bar that even the campus weightlifter can't lift. However, if that flywheel is spinning, it will try to keep spinning around the same axis. And if that axis is a horizontal axis, Getting up to speed here, thousands and thousands of revolutions Five, per minute. Four, three, two, one, I'm going to let go of my left hand. What you'll see is that the shaft remains horizontal. See it going around there. It almost looks as though the wheel is weightless. How does this work? Well, full physics explanation of the anti-gravity wheel and everything it's able to do with conservation of angular momentum and gyroscopic precession, head over to the YouTube link with the extra physics lecture in the bottom. Look at that. Class is the Viennese waltz, as experienced by my mother on her Fulbright year of 1969 when she got to open the ball at the Vienna Opera House. As we said in class, the difference between a regular waltz one, two, three, one, two, three. And a Viennese waltz is the fact that every one, two, three, the dancers make a complete circle, a full 360 degrees at that count. As you can see, it makes for truly breathtaking choreography and a tremendous amount of skill on the part of the dance major or professional dancer to make all those circles, keeping in perfect time without getting dizzy or losing their place. Now, as you can see, the traditional attire for the Viennese waltz uh, is tails for the gent and ankle length, white ball gown, truly Cinderella fashion, the fashion that has not changed in more than 500 years 
for this kind of dance. Why? Physics, not just fashion. Cinderella and all of her predecessors go to those balls wearing long, very heavy skirts, satin, brocade, silk, over satin, over velvet, over brocade, over hoop skirts, and at least three layers of petticoats. Even the gents have extra fabric hanging down, and look what happens to that fabric as you spin. That's right, it billows outward. Ask yourself, what does that do to your rotational inertia? What happens to your moment of inertia as that heavy, heavy fabric spins way out, more so for the lady's advantage than for the gentleman's, although he's holding her, so her advantage is shared with him. That's right, you have a really big moment of inertia, and that means you're gonna have a very big angular momentum. And that means that unless an outside force like friction on your satin slippers, all right, not so much friction there, produces a torque and interferes, once you start spinning, you will keep spinning all night long unless an outside force interferes. And my mother, who opened the ball at the Opera House in 1969, reports that once you really get going, you feel like you're flying. It feels like your shoes are barely touching the ground at all because they're not. Learner and Lowe sing, I could have danced all night. Yes, you could have danced all night, and this is why conservation of angular momentum. The hard part isn't to keep spinning. The hard part is to stop when the dance is over.